Donc, je vais commencer par introduire le professeur euh, donc, que nous accueillons aujourd'hui, euh, professeur Beng Liu de l'Université de Montréal, euh, membre, euh, des, je pense, des deux laboratoires Rally et Mila, spécialisé en traitement automatique du langage naturel. Et donc, il a obtenu euh, ses deux diplômes de maîtrise et de doctorat de l'Université de l'Alberta à Edmonton. Donc, professeur euh, Liu va nous parler aujourd'hui euh, de la compréhension du langage naturel, Data, Knowledge and Logic, Modeling and Reasoning for Natural Language Understanding. Donc, uh, you can start, uh, professor. Thank you. OK. Thank you, professor Fatia, for the introduction and the invitation. And thanks, everyone, for attending my talk. So I will start sharing my screen. So uh, today I will talk about uh, data, knowledge, and logic, modeling and reasoning for natural language understanding. So basically, I will introduce uh, a part of my research works. So uh, this is the outline of today's talk. So first, I will briefly mention what is natural language processing and why NLP is hard. And then I will introduce my research on uh, question generation, which is the main part of this talk. And I will also briefly introduce my research about ontology creation. And finally, briefly mention an ongoing work about logical reasoning. So let's start from uh, what is natural language processing. So actually, natural language processing is everywhere in our daily lives. For example, uh, there are many products of Google, uh, Google Translate, uh, the search engine, and being Yahoo, I do, and many other uh, search engines. And uh, I think uh, a part of us may have used the uh, smart speakers from different companies, such as uh, Amazon Echo, uh, Google Home, and so on. And uh, recently, there are many companies are talking about uh, some concepts like the uh, metaverse. And uh, the research about chatbots or virtual characters, or we say Avatar, so it includes the Microsoft Xiaomi, the uh, Xiaomi from the Xiaomi, and Bilibili Yosa, and Baidu's Xiaotu, and Mihayo Yoyo, and so on. So basically, uh, for these different chatbots, uh, they have the ability to communicate with people or generate the music and many other artworks. So basically, this is a kind of a format which integrates the different uh, uh, tasks in natural processing. And uh, there are many mobile apps which uh, they rely on different natural processing tasks, uh, includes the social network apps, WeChat, QQ, and uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Google, Weibo, and so on. So we have like different parts in these apps, including the searching, the fit news streams, the uh, analyze of the short text, uh, such as Twitter and microblog, and the analyze of the long documents, as like the news media and so on, and also the chatbots for health and so on. So formally speaking, language is a tool of human communication and a carrier of human thinking. There are more, uh, almost like 2,000 different types of language in use all over the world. And the structures of the different languages vary between different uh, between of them. And the natural language is a human language, which is opposed to constructed language, such as uh, C programming language, Python, and so on. And it's, uh, so basically, for our, uh, if we have a machine which can process the input language and output language so that it can communicate uh, with human beings. Then the path from the language to the format, which is understandable by the computer, is the process of natural language understanding and the, pro uh, and the process of generating the language from its internal representation is the natural language generation. And why NLP is hard? There are many reasons, and we will mainly talk about ambiguity and knowledge here. So for ambiguity, so if you look, we look at this example, so we have a sentence, at the last a computer that understands you like your mother. So we can actually understand it in different ways. For example, it can mean that uh, it understands you as well as your mother understands you. Or it means it understands that you like your mother. And or it can also mean it understands you as well as it understands your mother. So basically the different meaning of the uh, sentence uh, corresponds to the different interpretation of the syntactic structure. 
And we also have ambiguity from the semantic level uh, or the uh, acoustic level and so on. Another challenge is about uh, is the knowledge. So basically to understand the language, it's hard to purely interpret the, the word from the text itself. So to understand a sentence, we need knowledge about different things. So the knowledge about the language itself, knowledge about the world and knowledge about common sense and so on. So if we look at these two sentences, the first is I dropped the glass on the floor and it broke. And the second is I dropped the hammer on the glass and it broke. So what does the it means in each of the sentence? So we know that the first it means the glass and the second is the floor. So uh, we, we can know that uh, the it corresponds to the different part of the sentence because we know the common sense about the physical property of the different objects, but it cannot be captured from the text itself. So uh, state of the art, uh, Measures about natural processing tasks are mainly based on pre-trained large-scale language models. So start from the success of the BERT model. And we have like a lot of drivers from this base model. We have the uh, Roberta, Elmo, uh, we have the GP2, uh, XLNet, uh, and so on. So basically uh, for these models, they include the pre-training from the a large corpus of text and the fine-tuning on different tasks. So basically a uh, language model is uh, since you use every day. So it's the task of predicting what word comes next. For example, if you input uh, some text in your, uh, in your search engine, then you will have like a lot of uh, candidate queries, which uh, helps us like what you are going to input the next. So this is like predict the next word based on what you have already typed in your cell phone or in your computer. And here we can see some examples, what the uh, current uh, present language model can do. So for example, this is the AI writer created uh, by, I think it's uh, GPT-3. So uh, if you give like give the model a start sentence, it can complete it uh, by a whole document. So this article, it looks like a article written by a professional uh, scholar. So it's hard to tell like whether it's a, uh, generated text from a machine or is generated by a human writer. And it's not just uh, written uh, articles. For example, it can also produce like the code for a designer based on your requirement. And it can also even produce the machine learning code based on what you need. And this is also actually a kind of a uh, language model. So Basically, it, it generates, it's a kind of a multi-model or uh, pre-trained language model. So based on your text prompt, uh, it can generate the image based on your text description. So you can see if you input like an armchair in the shape of an avocado, you can, uh, it can produce this kind of image. And if you input like a storefront that has the word open eye written on it, and this generated image also satisfies your requirement. So this is the work from the OpenAI, which is the Dela E model. So uh, the common paradigm of such kind of pre-trained language model uh, usually consists of two parts. So we have the pre-training part, which is like you pre-train a large scale language model based on a large corpus. So you just predict the mass part of some sentence. It can be from the left to right, or it can be uh, some missing words in the middle of the sentence. And then after you pre-trained uh, this model using this uh, unlabeled text, you can fine tune it over some supervised learning tasks. For example, you can surprise it, uh, fine tune it on question answering task, or uh, part of speaking and so on. So uh, in, in this process, uh, we still like uh, need the training data for the downstream tasks, but it's actually not easy to acquire high uh, large scale and high quality training data for different tasks. For example, for question answering, if you need uh, like a large corpus of question answering data set, 
it actually costs a lot and time and human efforts. And also, uh, the current state of the art uh, lack model still uh, lack of enough common sense and knowledge. So here's just an example like produced by the GPTC model. So if you look at the left part, you cannot tell that uh, it is a chatbot. Actually, it's uh, uh, almost correct. So what is your favorite animal? My favorite animal is a dog. And why? Because dogs are loyal and friendly. So if you look at this dialogue on the left, it's very natural and you can, cannot tell whether it's a robot or not. But on the right, if you see this uh, example, so if you ask how many eyes does my foot have, and it responds, your foot have two, has two eyes. And how many eyes does a spider have? A spider has eight eyes. So you can see that even though this uh, response is uh, natural in terms of the grammar structure, but it doesn't satisfy our common sense about this different type of objects, about these animals. So a lack of enough common sense and knowledge is a serious problem of these language models. So the uh, the up pyramid uh, tells that from data to wisdom, we have like more and more high level information here. So for data in its native uh, form, it is sparse, distributed and unstructured. So it's chaotic. And when we transformation, do transformation and organization, so we can transform data into information. And knowledge is connected information. And identify meaningful pieces of information and relate them to each other is to insight and wisdom. So uh, creating data set actually costs time and money, as we mentioned. So nowadays, there are like many companies uh, which like uh, mainly focus on labeling data for a big company. So for example, the super annotate 20 billion uh, remote task and so on. So these companies are like designed for creating training data set for machine learning tasks. And understanding language needs to understand the world. As we mentioned the example about uh, how to interpret it in these two different sentences. And also uh, perception is not enough. We also need logic and reasoning. So uh, as, as described in a book that uh, the human brain has like kind of two different systems. So for the system one, it is good at like uh, fast processing uh, and be un unconscious. And uh, it can automatically do some everyday decisions and it's usually error prone. So basically system one is mainly focused on perception level intelligence. And it's what the current deep learning systems are good at. And for system two, it's used for like slow, uh, conscious, and effortful decision making. And it can help us to perform complex decisions and it's more reliable. And for system two part, it, it is like what we need to further enhance in the current uh, machine learning models. So uh, to summarize about our current, uh, part of our current research, we are trying to improve the uh, deep learning models in terms of the uh, data level, information and knowledge level, as well as the uh, wisdom level. So for the data part, we, we perform an automatic data set creation. We want to like reduce the effort of creating large scale data set and also improve the learning efficiency of the data. And the second is uh, the text mining and knowledge construction. So we want to uh, construct uh, ontology or knowledge graph from unstructured uh, text for example, short text like queries and the long text like web pages or documents. And for wisdom, we want to incre uh, improve the reasoning ability of machine learning model. So basically our current research is about learning and reasoning with graphs so that we can enable the machine to perform more human-like reasoning and it's like more transferable and robust. So my talk about uh, our research will cover like the data part is about efficiently creating data set with automatic question generation. And for the knowledge part, we will talk about modeling the world with ontology creation and expansion. And for knowledge logic part, I will briefly mention a work about real discovery with reinforced and recurrent relational reason. So let's start from the first part, which is about question generation. 
So here our uh, our problem is how to generate question and answer curves from unlabeled corpus. So here gives an example. So if you have a passage, Tony gave a speech yesterday in New York, and the existing uh, research about question answering is uh, mainly focused on answer of question generation. So basically you have a passage and you have an answer. For example, here the answer is Tony, and in your data set, you are supposed to generate a question like, who gave a speech yesterday? So this is called answer of question generation because you know the answer as an input. But we have a problem. So if you have an answer, actually you can ask, uh, ask different questions, which has the same answer. For example, for this input, you can ask who gave a speech yesterday or who gave a speech in New York and so on. So for these different questions, they all satisfy with this input, passage and answer. But in your data set, you only have the one golden answer. So in this way, if you uh, generated another satisfying question, you won't get a full score uh, based on your data set. So uh, this is called the one-to-many one mapping program because you have the one type of input and actually you can have many different outputs, but in your data set, you only have one output. So uh, we analyze like how human ask questions. So let's say if you have this passage, so you may first select a part of the passage as the answer. For example, we select Tony as the answer part. The second is, uh, when you ask a question, you need to like repeat or rephrase some part of the input as your uh, message in your question. So for example, uh, we call it as clue. So here we can use give a speech yesterday as a clue for the question. And also uh, you will have a style for your question. So here, your answer is a human's name. Then the style will be who. So you will generate this question. So who gave a speech yesterday? And the answer is Tony. And gave a speech yesterday. What uh, is repeated in this question as a clue? And the style is who. And if you change a part of the input, for example, if you replace the clue with gave a speech in New York, and you will have a different question. Who gave a speech in, in New York? So uh, based on this kind of uh, the interpretation about the process of human asking a question, we designed the answer clue style aware question generation. So which is uh, called ACS aware QG. So basically the idea is instead of input the uh, passage and the answer as the input, we want to input more fine-grained uh, inputs uh, with more different types of, of information so that we can have like a more fine-grained control over the generation process and also based on more fine-grained uh, inputs, you can actually have almost uh, one type of output. So that the one-to-many uh, mapping program will be reduced to almost one-to-one -one mapping. Because you have so much input to control your output, the, the target uh, question uh, is hard to have like two different kinds of uh, formats. So here, uh, this is the system architecture of our SS RQG. So the pink part is about obtaining data set. And the blue part is about uh, sampling the inputs. And the internal part is about uh, the generating the question based on the sampled inputs. And the filter can control the quality. And finally, we output the filtered uh, passage question answers. So this is a paper which introduced the whole system. So next, we will introduce each module. So the first module is uh, we didn't have how we can get a training data set for our new task. So in existing question answer data sets, we have the passage, we have the question, and we have the answer. But we didn't have the clue and style defined in our task. So we need to like uh, obtain it automatically instead of ask humans to label in this task. So first, uh, to get the clue part, we show the uh, phenomena of copy or soft copy. So for example, here we have a passage, Ari is five years old. And if you ask a question, how old is Ari? So here, this word old is co directly copied into the question. So this is the clue part. But in, in another question, you have this question like, is Ari an adult? 
So this here, a dot is not the same with odd. But actually, the word odd in the passage is the reason why you have this a dot in this question. So we call this like highly correlated words in the question. It's a kind of soft copy from the input passage. So based on this principle, which it says that clue is a part of the input uh, passage, which is copy or uh, soft copy to the question, we can get uh, the clue part by uh, this copy uh, mechanism. And we can get style by rules. So basically uh, for this uh, copy part, you, you can like enumerate the different engrams in the passage and different engrams in the question, then you calculate the sum score to get the overlapping scores so that uh, you select the uh, phrase which have the maximum length and the maximum similarity with the input passage. So uh, for details, you can look at the paper. And for styles, you can like, we actually we extract the style of the question based on some rules as well as a simple classifier because it's just like most of the time you can identify the style from the first word of the question. And for some other cases, a simple classifier can like identify the type of the question. So we have different types, the who, what, why, how, or either, uh, and other types and so on. And the second part, the second part is sampling the inputs. So here we have the problem of input warming uh, explosion. So basically for sampling inputs, it is that uh, if you have a sentence, we want to sample different types of input to generate a question. So we have the passage P, and we also need to sample the answer part A and the crew part C and the style S. So we have the input volume uh, explosion pro uh, problem. So basically it means that if you have a sentence, Actually, you can sample many, many different combinations of this answer clue style combination. For example, if you have a sentence which contains only like 10 words, you can actually sample over 1,000 types of ACS combination. So for these tables, uh, most of the tables are meaningless. So for example, if you sample answer A as 20, the clue is uh, like uh, in and the style is win. So here we can see that the style doesn't match with the type of the answer. So that you cannot ask a worthy question based on this tuple. So to uh, solve this problem, we propose a sequential sampling mechanism. So basically we decompose this sampling process by a sequential factorization. So first we give the passage P, we sample the answer part A, and then given this P and A, we sample the style S, and finally, we sample the clue based on the previously sampled information. And to get like the probability distribution of these three different conditional distributions, we can actually like uh, get these statistics from an existing data set. For example, you can calculate these probabilities based on the squad data set. And finally, to generate questions, uh, we like we adapted the uh, encoder decoder sequence to sequence model with attention mechanism and copy mechanism. And we also adapted the GPT-2 model to generate our questions. So for the GPT-2, uh, we can incorporate the position of the answer and the clue as a position encoding in the input part. And then we can connect with the passage with the passage information and with the style and then use the output, uh, use the question as the output. So that based on this kind of format, we can learn, uh, learn, uh, fine tune the GPT-2 language model over our data set. And finally, uh, we further train a, a binary classifier to control the quality of the generated question answer pairs. So here, if you have this input passage and you generated this question with an answer, Basically, it's a textual entailment problem. So uh, it means that if you can calculate the question with the answer, the meaning contained in this query pair will be entailed with the input passage. So this is basically, this is a binary classification. 
So uh, uh, based on our SSQG system, we generated like uh, almost 3 million question answer plus based on uh, from uh, 10,000 Wikipedia articles. So by a uh, small scale human uh, evaluation, we found that uh, the question generated by our system, like uh, more than 70% of them is well-formed, which means that if you look at the question, uh, it doesn't have uh, like serious syntactic problem. Uh, and uh, more than like 65% of the question is re relevant instead of some random question, which is not relevant to the input passage. And in overall, more than half of them is correct, which means the question uh, doesn't have uh, like important grammatical errors and the question is relevant and the answer matches with the question. So on the left, we show an uh, example. So if you have this uh, input passage, you can generate different questions with different answers. So the uh, orange color indicates the style of the question. You have the what and the which type. And the blue is the answer of the question. And the green part is the, is the clue from the uh, input passages. So we can see from the same sentence, we can have different combination of QA pairs. And we evaluated the performance of our question generation uh, system, uh, which is the uh, CS2S VR ACS uh, model. We can see that the performance in terms of the blue scores and the right and the meter is much better than the previously uh, previous baselines. And we have also mentioned an another work, which is the CGCQG in this uh, table. It's actually our previous uh, work. So in this work, we didn't like define, use the clue as an input. Actually, we just predict which part of the passage can be the uh, clue. And actually we can say that this CGCQG model also outperforms many other baselines, which indicates that even though you didn't fit the clue part as the input, uh, it's also helpful to predict it so that uh, your model like generates the question more like uh, the human process. So uh, in our, this work about question generation, we generated a lot of data, but the performance of question answering is not improved yet. So basically we improve our generated data to train a better question answering model. We found that the performance is not uh, as good as training all the original data set. So the reason uh, is, uh, there are many aspects of the reason. So for example, uh, your generated question is like uh, uh, homogeneous with the uh, questions in your data set. So that even though you have more training data, uh, your model may be already familiar with this type of questions and it doesn't need more uh, this type of questions. And also you have like many areas in your data set. So this now you will further like uh, lower your performance. So our next, our next uh, work is about difficulty controllable question generation. So basically in this work, we want to improve or control the reasoning logic and the difficulty level of our questions. So for example, if you given this context, Tom Cruise began acting in the early 1980s and started in the action film. And you, for this DCQG, which is difficulty controllable question generation, we want to control the output questions difficulty level, the underlying logic, as well as the answer. So we, have, we can have different questions. Who start uh, Top Gun? Or who start the film directed by Tony Scott? Or who start a 1986 action film directed by Tony Scott? You can see that the questions are actually become more and more complex with the same answer. So this is the framework of our difficulty controllable question generation. So the idea is like, uh, we have this, we first turn the context into a knowledge graph. So it's like a document level knowledge graph. Basically we extract triplets uh, from the context and connect them. And then uh, we perform step-by-step -step question generation so first, we will like sample the uh, reason chain. 
we will sample a qubit from the uh, graph. And based on it, we will generate an initial question, which is called Q1 in this uh, framework. So the Q1 is like who directed dial M for murder. And then based on this initial question, we will rewrite it into a more complex one. So basically we will sample another uh, written chain, which is related to the part we want to replace. So here from the Q1 to Q2, we get the who directed the film to which a prefix murder was a modern remarker. So uh, here we show the process. So first we uh, convert the given raw text into a complex graph. And then we sample a reasoning chain and the answer of the generated question from the graph. So here we choose Tom Cruise as the answer node. And then we sample this red part. And we have this step-by-step -step question generation. So first we generate the initial question based on this triplet, the Tom Cruise uh, start Top Gun. So we have this question, who start Top Gun? And next we revise the initial question to a more complex one. So here Tom Cruise is replaced by the film directed by Tony Scott. So this corresponds to the second chain, triplet. So uh, Tony Scott, got directed top gun. And we can further improve the complexity of the question, which is like in introduce more reasoning half into the question by sampling another related uh, triplets in this knowledge graph. So we can get this Q3, who we'll started a 1986 action film directed by Tony Scott. So you can see that by gradually increase the complexity, increasing the Reasoning hub of this question, we can control the difficulty level and the reasoning logic of the output question. So uh, we also need to uh, construct a data set for our task. So basically we utilize the hub mod QA, where most of the questions require two hubs of reasoning, and we we'll implement a question decomposer which can decompose a two half question into two sub questions, sub question one and sub question two, based on the spam prediction and the linguistic rules. And finally, we can get a data set that contains two half questions and the corresponding one half questions. So for example, if you have this QA pair from the hub QA, it is a two half uh, reasoning in question, and we can get like these two sub question one and the sub answer one as well as the sub-question two and answer two. So in this way, we don't need like a human to manually create a data set for our data, for our task. Instead, we just uh, generate it from an existing multiple question answering task. So uh, in this, uh, based on our difficulty controllable question generation, we generated more data set uh, from the existing part about QA. And we can see that uh, if we like, uh, if we fit the generated data into the question answering model. So here we train uh, a GPT based question answering model. Uh, we can see that. So we have like two different uh, settings for the experiment. For the orange experiments, we use 100% of the original hardware QA data, uh, and we use another half of our generated data. And in the low resource setting, we have only like 25% uh, of the original hardware QA, and then we augment it with our generated data. And here we compare with the baseline, which is the question generated by GPT-2 model. We can see that uh, if we increase the data set by our generated data, no matter uh, whether we have the full data set or we have only like a partial of the hardware QA, our generated uh, data can actually increase the performance of the question answering model. And also our performance is uh, keep being better than the baseline GP2 model. Our third question is like, how good is the data and the question answer model? So uh, first we can consider this example 
So what capabilities are needed for ping pong? So a competency assessment is that assessment of someone's capability against the requirements of the job. So uh, you know that uh, for the ping pong player, Malo, we call it like the uh, six uh, fully uh, equipped uh, uh, player. So basically, uh, he's a very excellent ping pong player who, who is like very good at different skills. So he has uh, very good power, uh, speed, skill, T of defense and experience. So, uh, and it's also like, if you consider about an NLP model, for example, if you consider the capability of a model for question answering, you may ask like, what kind of skills is needed for a model to answer different questions? So our question is like, what capabilities are needed for question answering? So we can, here we show two uh, questions. So two example questions, question one and two, with different difficulties, require different capabilities. So for question one, like who is the trouble uh, making turtle? And the answer is James. So actually for this question one, it only need to match the words between the question and the context. Because in the context, you have this sentence, James is a trouble making turtle. So if you match question one with the context, you will easily find the answer is James. And for question two, where did James go after he went to the grocery store? And the answer is a fast food restaurant. So here it requires more complex capabilities. So it needs you to understand the syntactic matching, the temporal relation between different actors, and the semantic overlap between questions and the context. So basically in our work, we define four major capability dimensions for understanding text and self-human machine reading comprehension tasks, so which are inspired by the computational model of human text comprehension in psychology. So basically we define like four types of uh, capabilities, reading words, reading sentences, understanding words, and understanding sentences. So for reading words, it includes like the ability, ability of recognized vocabulary, recognize function words and so on. And we use the metrics from the different existing works. And for re uh, reading sentences, it means the ability to recognize the sentence grammatically and the readability. For understanding words, it means the ability to, to perform arithmetic operation, logical operation and so on. So for example, if you compare reading words and understanding words, if the model knows a word is a number, but it cannot like sum up the two number to get the result of this sum, it means this model can read the words, but it doesn't understand the word because it doesn't know how to operate over this word. And the last is understanding sentences. It, it, it consists the ability of like perform linguistic reasoning or factual reasoning and so on. So basically for these different uh, categories of capability, we use existing metrics to calculate a lot of values and we normalize this value and get the, like, the final score for the different capability dimension. And uh, based on the capability measure of a question answer model, we further propose the capability boundary breakthrough curriculum learning. So the model capabilities are passed by the corresponding difficult sample subset and the samples around the bridge boundary are picked to strengthen the model. So if you look at this pipeline, so basically we mean that first we have like, have a sample pools. So uh, we, ha we have these different shapes correspond to the four types of uh, different capabilities and the color, uh, the, uh, the shadowing of the color indicates the strength of, uh, of the difficulty. And here uh, we have the hard development set. So basically uh, for different uh, capability, we have a set of samples, which is like have a high difficulty in a dimension and is easier in, another, uh, in the other dimensions. So basically based on this hard development set, we can measure the capability of the model in terms of the uh, four dimension. 
And then when we, we select the next batch to train the model, we will uh, select the samples, which is like, it has a difficulty around the boundary of its current capability. It means that if you want to efficiently learn your model, you need to like select the samples, which is either not too easy or, or not too hard for the current model itself. In this way, you're trying to push the model around the current capability boundary. In this case, you're actually guiding the learning of the model based on your uh, measurement about its capability status. And also the current model's status also can guide your model to generate more appropriate training data. And this is the, uh, the experiments indicate that uh, actually uh, by learning, training the model with our current, uh, the curriculum boundary uh, breakthrough strategy, actually we can improve the learning efficiency because we are like, we are selecting more appropriate training data based on the status of the model. And the right figure indicates that uh, the most important uh, part is about the, the first dimension, which is the uh, uh, capability of understanding sentences. This helps uh, to improve the learning efficiency of the models a lot. Uh, this figure shows that during the learning process, uh, all of the four dimensional uh, capabilities are keep increasing based on our uh, curriculum boundary through a training strategy. Okay, uh, to summarize. So uh, first we generate question answer press from unlabeled text. So we use a uh, factorizing input information and the sequential sampling as well as the automatic data set creation to uh, uh, consist of uh, our uh, system for this uh, question generation part. And then next, we control the difficulty of the generated question answer first by combining the graph representation of the input passage and by sampling the written chain from the uh, passage. And we se sequentially uh, increase the reasoning hops of a question to control the difficulty level of the output. And in our third work, we measure the capability of a question answer model. So we define the different data properties or model capabilities. And we pro propose the capability boundary which through curriculum learning to uh, help the model to learn more efficiently based on the data. Next, I will talk about our research on ontology creation. So here the uh, problem is how to infer the user's interest so for example, if a user input a query to estimate the resonation speech in the search engine. So uh, if the uh, if a recommender system recommends articles about resume, uh, this may cause a problem of inaccurate recommendation because the user may be not interested in resume uh, herself. Another uh, phenomenon is uh, the recommender system may recommend other articles about the remains with the nature speech. However, the user may already have read several uh, news articles about this event. So this causes the problem of monotonous recommendation. And a good recommendation may be articles about Brexit negotiation. Uh, so uh, to achieve such kind of a performance, we need like two parts. The first is we need to identify that the user interest in a suitable granularity. So we must know that Brexit negotiation is a good user interest. And the second is we need to identify the relationship between user interests. So we need to know that the event to resume with the nation speech is actually belongs to this topic, Brexit negotiation. So in this way, if we see that the user read some articles about the resume with speech, we may think, oh, this user may be interested in the topic, practice negotiation, so that you can recommend uh, news articles about other events belong to this topic to this user. 
So we need to ask like, what kind of information does people care about? So the first type is events. So we define events as a real world incident that involves specific persons, organizations, or entities with a certain time or location of occurrence. For example, Theresa May's realization speech is an event, or Apple launched new iPhone, or iPhone, uh, this year is like iPhone 13. Another type of information people care about is, uh, are concepts. So we define concepts as a collection of things that share some common attributes. So for example, the Honda Civic, the Honda Electron, who may think these cars are belong to fuel efficient cars or economic cars. So these are two concepts. Or the Iron Man or Captain America belongs to the concept Marvel heroes or Rangers. So what, what we did is uh, in our work published uh, on, in Sigma uh, 2020, so we created a web scale ontology to represent user interests and document topics. So here we, we can see the whole uh, architecture of the ontology. So basically we have like different types of nodes in the ontology, it includes the black nodes, which we call the category. So they contain like a uh, modern, so 1,000 uh, different predefined categories, includes like the technology, current events, and so on. And then we have the different phrases, which are uh, mined from the user queries and document titles, so which includes the concept phrases, the topic phrases, and event phrases. For example, uh, we have these like pretty cell phones, uh, cell phones for the elderly, and so on. And we have the different events, uh, topics, cell phone launch, uh, to estimate uh, uh, Brexit negotiation, and so on. And we have different events. For example, uh, Apple launched new iPhone, and so on. And also uh, we have the entity nodes. So for different entities, it may belong to different uh, concepts. And for the urges in this ontology, the main part is the either relationship, which indicates the, uh, an event it belongs to a topic or an entity belongs to a concept. We further define the involved relationship and the creative relationship. So the involved relationship means like some event, uh, some concept is involved in an uh, event. And for the creative relationship, it actually links some uh, and it press, which are like frequently mentioned together in the input query or documents. So uh, the, uh, the ontology is created by the system which is called giant. So here shows the whole framework of the giant system. So we have, uh, first we have like the uh, users, queries and documents. So in this way, if you like input different queries, you may click different documents. Then this uh, actually can be represented by a five-party graph. So where the left part is the set queries and the right part are the top click documents. And then we perform like query document clustering so that we can split the big five-party graph into different small query document clusters. Well, in each cluster, you will have like several highly uh, uh, semantically the same queries and highly related documents. Therefore, for each cluster, it is possible that we may extract a phrase from it. It can be a concept, an event, or a topic. And then we have an algorithm to identify the relationship. So if you have like a new phrase, which is a new node in the ontology, you can find a place to insert it into the existing ontology. And finally, based on this ontology graph, you can actually use it to tag the user interest for different users. And you can use it for document tagging, which is like you can tag a document uh, by some concept tag or even a tag to indicate its main uh, content. It can also be utilized for the query conceptualization. So if you input some like entities in the search engine, you can infer that you're actually interested in some type of concepts or topics that actually it can help to generalize your query.
carry into a more broad range of topics. So here, uh, the key research problem is like how to uh, mine the heterogeneous phrase from the queries and titles. So here we show an example. So if you have this query, what are the, uh, the higher Miyazaki's animated film? And then you have like different documents which are related to this query. And uh, the objective here is like, whether we can extract this phrase. Here is a concept, higher Miyazaki animated film. And for other phrases, for example, events or topics, uh, the algorithm is the same. So we can analyze the characteristic of the output words. First, to actually show some patterns in the query and the titles. And the second is they actually show up multiple times. And uh, also the named entity or part of these tags of these words are useful because most of the output words may be a name, noun phrase, instead of some uh, stop words and so on. And also most of the words, they are continuous chunk in the query or title. And sometimes you, you may have like one or several stop words between them. But most of the times they're actually a continuous phrase in the original query and title. And finally, even though these words may like shuffle a little bit in different places of the query or titles, the syntactic dependency of them uh, between the different words in the concept phrase or uh, even phrase, usually the syntactic dependency won't change. So based on this analysis, we want to like try to show these features more obvious. So basically we turn the queries and titles into a, a query title interaction graph. So here we show the graph constructed from the previous example. So basically we have, a, for each query and title, we add a virtual node, start of sentence SOS, end of sentence US. And we have these different word nodes. Then for all the queries and titles, we merge them. So each node represents a unique word in a query or a title. If two words are adjacent to each other, we have a, like a sequential urge between them. Otherwise, we check whether the two words have any syntactic dependency between them. If yes, we add the syntactic dependency between the two words. And finally, for each type of urge, we also add the inverse urge between them. So basically, the patterns in the sequential text tends to the graph structured pattern. And the feature that they will may show up multiple times turn into the node feature. And the word text also can be represented by the node feature. And the continuous chunk are actually indicated by the sequential urges between different word nodes. And the syntactic dependency was like captured by the syntactical urge between different words. So uh, to extract a phrase between, uh, from this uh, graph, first we need to classify whether a word is belong to the output phrase. So here, the Haya Miyazaki anime film, so these three words belong to the out, uh, output phrase. So here we, is actually a node classification problem. So we trained a relational graph convolution network to perform this task. And after that, we need to like, to arrange the different words into the, uh, into the output phrase. So we need to order them. So basically we consider it as a asymmetric uh, traveling assessment problem. So what we want to find uh, the shortest path from the start of sentence to the end of sentence. And this path will like go through each of the output word for one time and connect them. And, we, and this path has the shortest length uh, among all every possible passes. And this problem can be solved by existing algorithm. So we have talked about how, like how to uh, mine different phrases from the query and titles. Basically, it is a node in the taxonomy. The next problem is like how to add a new term into the taxonomy. So let's say if you uh, extracted a new concept, you need to find the most suitable place in the existing taxonomy or ontology. 
to insert it. So uh, this work uh, we published in the web conference 2021 uh, solves this problem by uh, like, so here shows the whole framework of our model. So we won't go to more details, but I will briefly describe it. So basically the previous research work, so we mainly compare the input query node and uh, candidate answer node, uh, candidate uh, father, father node. So basically, uh, they are classifying what the input query Q has the uh, parent child relationship, the user relationship between this Q and answer node, uh, the anchor node A. But in our work, we, we infer like whether this input query uh, belongs to like this path. So we not only compare it with the parent node, we also compare it with the ancestors as well as the candidate nodes children. So if this uh, query node is a good, is good to insert as a child of the parent A, then it should be uh, like very coherent with its children. So because they are siblings and also it should be like coherent with the ancestors of this parent node. So basically we compare the, uh, the relevance between the input query node and all this uh, ancestors and the child, we call this structure as the eagle tree. And also the name of these nodes are not only the names, so we expand the description of each node by the definition in the word node. So uh, here's just the application scenario of our like junk system. So here, uh, this is like some fish new streams in the Wiki browser application. So here's just a document. So the title is like CDs cars with less than 100 km fuel consumption and up to 1,000 kilometer recharge millilitre. And we can tag this concept, low fuel consumption cars to this document, which indicates that this document is actually talking about some no field consumption cars. But we, cannot, uh, we can see that this concept is never shown in the title, or uh, it also not uh, mentioned in the document with the exact wording. So in this case, we can actually describe the main content of the document by such kind of short text. So uh, for logical reasoning, so here is uh, our ongoing work. So basically uh, we want to enable a model to uh, perform, uh, to reasoning our graphs. So for example, here's an, uh, uh, so let's say we, we have this graph one and graph two. So we hope that our model can learn from uh, some simple inputs to uh, learn some simple rules from the training data. And then it can be able to uh, combine these learned rules and, and the reason about more complex examples. So let's see from the training graph one, we can learn a rule. If X is the mother of Z and Z is the sister of Y, and we can infer that X is the mother of Y. And from the training graph two, we can learn another rule. If X is the mother of Z and Z is the father of Y, we can learn that X is the grandma of Y. Then we hope that a model can predict uh, on figure three using the aforementioned two rows. So uh, we, we proposed a reasoning mechanism which is called R5, which means like recurrent relational reasoning uh, for a uh, row uh, Extraction. So basically, uh, our idea is like if you have like a uh, graph input data and we want to reason about the relationship between two candidate nodes, let's say X and Y, and actually it's, uh, it's like playing a go. So you can extract different passes between X and Y. And then what we need to do is like whether we can 
go through one of the paths and merge all of these relationships to the final uh, relations based on some row compositional rows, relation compositional rows. By, by talking about these rows, it's like the relation one with relation two can be merged into relation three, just like, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, just like uh, if you combine the mother relation with the sister relation and you get the mother relation, and if you combine the mother and the father relation, you can get the grandma relation. So uh, if you go through a, a path, it's like uh, during the each step, you are sampling an action. Well, each action is like whether you can merge uh, relation one and the relation two in a uh, output the relation three. And by iterate over this process, and finally, one of the paths will be merged into the final output relation. And we actually learn some uh, reinforced learning based agent to perform this reasoning process. And yeah, so uh, this uh, work is still uh, uh, under submission. So currently, uh, we don't have like more details about it. So basically, uh, it looks like uh, the uh, the Go algorithm. So it's just based on the reinforcement learning, and we design a dynamic row memory to store all the actions we have uh, utilized during this process. And we have like a scoring mechanism to uh, assign scores to the different rules we have tried, which is also the different actions during this process. And finally, we will keep the growth with uh, a score above a threshold. And thanks. Uh, any questions? Okay, don't. thank you very much, uh, Professor Bank. So, uh, yeah, it's time for questions. Thank you for the presentation. So, I have yeah. here some uh, question asked by um, first Stephen Harnad. Professor Harnad um, made a comment in the chat. Yeah, uh, I'm looking at about thank correction. You. Correction of two phrases. So uh, the question, uh, it broke, means the same in both sentences. The only difference is that you can see I dropped the hammer on the grass and the hammer broke the grass. Or not, I dropped the grass and the grass broke the grass. The question, I dropped the grass on the floor and the grass broke the grass. Yeah, I think uh, this is a comment. Yeah, it's a comment, it's not a question. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, the next question is from Pierre Vadney. Uh, yeah, uh, he said, in New York yesterday, uh, implies a sound basis about time space. What is it uh, coming from? Where is it coming from? So in New York yesterday, it might have sound based. Yeah, so uh, in New York, exactly, uh, if you look at the example, it is also a part of the input passage. So let me go to the slides. Yeah, so here's the passage that like, Tony gave a speech yesterday in New York. So basically you have like two conditions defines the speech. So it happens yesterday, it happens in New York. So either one of the input message can be the clue part in the question. So that's why we can like, you can select uh, yesterday as a clue, or you can select the in New York as a clue. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the next question is from Alba Albarasa. Could this ontology be structured learned, the structure learned as opposed to imposed? Should the relationships be qualified? Yeah. Uh, so. So basically, uh, in this ontology, the main relationship is still the ether relationship, like most of the ontologies. And we actually, <laughs> the manually designed part is the categories. So we manually designed like a top level categories, which covers the domains we are interested in. And all the others, so we extract the phrases from the query and titles, and we identify entities from documents. And we identify the relationships automatically instead of like 
uh, with too many too many designs. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, is there any question from the uh, the audience, people, students? Okay, Pierre. Pierre Vatten. Yes. Uh, if I can come back to the question question about uh, in New York yesterday. Uh, in fact, some, somewhere the, si the system knows that space time exists. How did you define, how did you give that to the system? You, somewhere you say that New York answered the question of where and yesterday the question of when, but yeah. Yeah. How, how does the system know that when and where exist? How does it? How did it learn that, or did you simply? Yeah, so, uh, so in the setting of the question uh, generation or question answering works uh, tasks, so the passage is like fit as a part of the input. So, for example, yeah. uh, if you are solving the question answering task, you have this passage as the input, and you ask the question, so like who gave a speech yesterday. And the system needs to reason about this question by combining this question with the input passage. Tony gave us speech yesterday in New York, and then give the answer. So the information source is from the passage itself. Maybe the named entity is a clue to, to, to generate this question. The fact that there is New York, so we can generate the question with where or who we can generate it with, so, uh, with Tony. Yeah, so uh, for the question generation, so the answer, the passage, and the clue. Uh, and, uh, so basically, the passage, answer, clue, and the style, all these four paths are our input. So let's say if you have this answer and this clue and this style, then the question can be who gave us speech yesterday. Because you have defined that gave us speech yesterday is a clue part, then this part shall be like uh, copied or rephrased into the question part. Yes, but you're talking about understanding. So yeah. somehow you assume that the system understands that gave a speech implies that it was done somewhere at some point in time. Oh, and, yeah, but, yeah. but nowhere in there, I agree that yesterday means some point in time and New York's some place on earth, but yeah. but I, I know that, I know that New York is a, is somewhere in the world and yesterday is somewhere in time. Yes, but yes. the system doesn't know that. So it, it doesn't really understand that it can make the question yesterday. It, it knows yeah, that yeah. It, can make, it, it can make a question about yesterday or about New York only yeah, yeah. because you say that these type of questions exist. So you're somewhere, you are building behind the system a basic, ontology at least about space-time and so many other things. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree. Actually, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I, Professor Fatiha, so the named entity recognition, uh, named entity uh, tag or the part of three tag can help to like give the information of, about the different inputs. So we know that uh, New York is a place that it can uh, ask like, well, uh, and if the answer is Tony, which is a uh, human being, then the uh, the question will be about who. So uh, when you talk about like uh, give a speech, needs to understand it happened in somewhere and uh, at some time. So basically, this is uh, just uh, learned through the text generation part of the model. So I don't think like the current uh, model it can actually uh, understand in the scenario semantically with a, like a world model. So it, it basically lets the pattern between the inputs and the outputs. Yeah. Yeah, so research, uh, most of the time on question generation relies on the five W and the one H, how. Uh, H, how. So yeah, uh, yeah. this generates answers a ba very basic answers for uh, information gathering and corpus question answering corpora uh, construction. So how about complex questions with complex uh, answers? In addition to the five W, 
and the yeah. one page. Yeah, so uh, currently uh, our complex question are mainly about the multiple question. So if we want to like a more complex one, which requires a uh, more complex reasoning. So basically uh, our hypothesis is that we can like try to formulate the input into a structured way. And we can like summarize the different parts of the input as like a hyper urge or hyper node in your representation. So for example, if you have a document with talking about a complex event and you can ask like why something happens. And this actually needs you to reason over the complex uh, details in the document. This actually like you're asking a higher level relation between a sub part of the document and uh, another sub part of the document. So in this way, instead of uh, asking questions about a very specific information like uh, who, Tony, or well in New York, you need to understand the document in a more broad range. And you need to reason the uh, relationship instead of only in the syntax level or in a short span. You need to actually try to link the message between a part of the document and a part of the, another part of the document with some like causal relationship and so on. So uh, currently I saw some research about introducing like uh, causality into the NLP models. I think this can be a very good uh, research direction to uh, improve the uh, model's uh, ability to understand the complex relationship between the, uh, in the text and ask more complex logical questions. Okay, thank you. So Professor Jean Guimenier has a question. Well, thank you very much for this highly sophisticated presentation. Um, okay. I, there's, I did understand all the parts, but uh, um, what seems important for me is that um, your model is doesn't process natural language just like having co occurrences of words or bags of words. You throw on the sentences a certain symbolic structure. Am I understanding you? Which are debatable, uh, but uh, e the, the, the important hypothesis that I understand is that if you want to process a natural language sentence, you cannot just have bags of words, you must project or map on them a certain, a certain structure. Uh, the difficulty, I, uh, or it's, it's a difficulty, but it's interesting, and it's related to uh, Fathia's uh, question, is that uh, this projection or the mapping of the structure or a certain symbolic logic structure on it, uh, is seems to be justified by your using common knowledge, common natural, uh, common, common knowledge about the world. Yeah. Uh, New York is a city and uh, New York is a, a time. Uh, yeah. This is common uh, knowledge, but there are certain texts that are a little bit more sophisticated. New York can be something else than just a place. It can be a, 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 a what I say, a symbolic uh, image or phantasm of, of somebody. Uh, compare New York to Paris. It's not comparing just the roads, it's comparing something cultural, something. And do you think that your, your model would upgrade or upgrow to more sophisticated? Uh, and complex understanding of what is a, a, a city or, or a, uh, a, uh, a time, place, because that's clear. But often the whole, your whole model is related to pushing the symbolic structures on these sentences because you have two or two types of questions, who, where, when. And many texts, at least that type of work I'm trying to do is, you, it's a little bit more sophisticated than does New York have streets and does New York, it's just a time. 
does your system or have you thought of these problems? How do you upgrade to these higher levels? For instance, in, in medicine, you, you, would you trust your system to answering a, a diagnostic about something? Because there you're going a little higher. If you go in a, a psychiatric text, it's not that easy. Yeah. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Yeah, so basically here, I think the core uh, philosophy problem is like, how do you define semantic? How do you define the meaning of a word or a text? So here, if you like use the part of speech or the named entity tag as uh, like uh, auxiliary information or the knowledge about New York or about the time, then we are like using a sh uh, shallow level syntactic information. So to further uh, like enhance our document, uh, enhance our model to more concretely understand the sentence. What I think is that uh, actually uh, we need to merge the different uh, common sense or knowledge about different things in a text in a, a better way. So let's say uh, you can actually, uh, a hypothesis uh, is that uh, we can understand uh, the a word by how we how it is related to other words or how it's related to other attributes or how it was used in different contexts. So if you define like a word as a node in a complex graph and the different text as its attribute and its occurrence with other words as the interaction between them and also its the, uh, syntactic dependency between one word with another word. So we can actually uh, like modeling the context uh, graph structure of a word or a piece of text. Uh, and then uh, to better understand uh, a word or a sentence, we can incorporate the different knowledge or different common sense into the graph representation of the, each word or the, or the whole piece of text. Then based on uh, the modeling of the, like, uh, a rich graph representation of a large corpus of text, we know that like, uh, the things like uh, similar to New York or uh, other city names. It is a city which can be, which is uh, actually a location and we can ask questions about where uh, for it. And if we, if we want to uh, understand it in a like more uh, higher level, it's like we're trying to uh, extract uh, uh, graph patterns from the structured representation of text. So yeah, so basically my uh, future uh, research objective is like how we can model the different text into a more sophisticated uh, graph representation and how we can incorporate or inject the knowledge or different common sense and so on into the modeling of the pure text so that we can um, understand the text based on the interaction between different words with different urges, with different attributes. It's like a social network of different text pieces. Do, do my may I continue, Fetia? Yeah, yes, do, sir. Do I understand you that uh, there in the model there's a learning of new information about the uh, the cities or the entities? It, it's not just world knowledge; it's also learning from other texts information that will be added in the ontology? Uh, current, uh, the current model only uses the uh, tech information, but uh, we can actually uh, further enhance it by external knowledge. Okay. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Pierre has another question. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, the question is really about, about semantic. And if you add a passage or if you use as your passage uh, in your slide there, uh, <clears throat> the famous uh, sentence from Chomsky, uh, colorless green ideas sleep fur furiously. I'm sure that your system could generate five, six questions about this, the passage and they would all be properly phrase and everything, but it means that the system did not understand anything. If, if, it, if you try to understand the sentence, 
any human will say, well, it doesn't make much sense, but it's perfectly uh, right on, at the symbolic level. And yeah. this is the, the problem everywhere. Uh, that's the problem that we are trying to solve in artificial intelligence. When, when do you think it would be possible to get something in that direction? And in fact, you're using the word understanding, but understanding a passage uh, goes further than, than parsing the words in the yeah, passage. Yeah. It, it, it goes to getting what is under or underlying uh, behind this passage. Yes. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, so let's go to this slide. So uh, basically, uh, my current research like uh, is uh, focused on different parts of the data knowledge or, or logical reasoning. So it's still uh, uh, so to like to reach what we want the machines to really understand a text. I think we need to like integrate the knowledge, the original data and the reasoning capability very well. So uh, it's like we are still in the initial stage of like how to modeling the representation form of the data. So from like the sequential, original sequential form into uh, also the syntactic level structure, whether we can like to extract more high level relationship, more high level structures from the raw text. And also whether we can uh, incorporate, uh, merge the external knowledge to enhance the representation of the text. And based on like a more comprehensive uh, representation of the input data, how we can like uh, extract the information of different level from the text and how we can reason about the different pieces of it to answer complex questions. So uh, what I want, uh, what I'm aiming for in the future is like uh, to further improve the representation form of different uh, data or information or knowledge and based on a more comprehensive way to representation, uh, we want to further like improve the reasoning ability of a model to understand the different parts of the text. Uh, for example, whether we can identify more high level uh, causal structure from the text and whether we can answer more complex questions such as why uh, and so that we can uh, learn the logic in the text instead of only the pure syntactic uh, structure. And uh, uh, about this uh, question that you generated, did you make um, an error analysis to see uh, the errors behind uh, uh, if there are some errors behind these generated questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we have, uh, for example, uh, we have some grammatical errors and also we have some kind of uh, type mismatching. So we don't have like a very uh, concrete uh, percentage about different type of errors. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Simon Ouellet. So do you want to ask it, Simon, or I read it? Sure, I can, yeah. So it's related to the current question, but it's a different phrasing of it. So do you think it's possible to reach human level uh, natural language understanding without using grounded language learning? So having an embodied intelligence that interacts with the real world? Yeah, yeah, actually this is also my current research interest, like how we can uh, understand uh, the text through interaction with the environment. For example, uh, uh, when a baby learns different concepts, the humans are teaching it, like to show it, like this is an apple, and it can eat the food. You can eat it. Uh, you, you will taste is uh, uh, this fruit. So what I think is that basically uh, we can interact with the different uh, parts of the environment to get feedbacks from it, and the language itself can also be a kind of reward so that it can help you to enhance the representation of different concepts in the model. For example, if you say like something is uh, uh, an apple and you actually looked at its figure 
and it will help you to improve the representation of it itself. And also it can help you to identify the relationship between Apple and other concepts, for example, the fruit or food or living and so on. So how we can like get different rewards from the interaction and how we can uh, get rewards from the input text or the language itself is something and deserve to research in the future, I think. Is there any uh, other question? So I have two small questions. To, to, uh, so, so about uh, the common sense that is very important to reach the human uh, uh, performance. So did you think to, uh, uh, to, to expand or to generate a common sense uh, ontology or expand an existing one like SIC, CYC, which uh, focus on implicit knowledge? by generating questions and having uh, answers? Uh, currently, uh, I don't have a research project on like generating the implicit knowledge or common sense knowledge. So we have, uh, we may have like some research project about like how to generate ontologies in different domain, specific domain. For example, uh, there are many companies in Quebec with the, uh, like the National Bank or some medical, uh, company, so they want to generate ontology from the bank documents or from uh, medical literature or scientific documents. So uh, for the ontology creation, it's like how we can uh, develop a more general uh, model, which can be quickly adapted to different in-domains with the specific in-domain knowledge. I think this is a very important program so that we, we don't need to like uh, create a specific model for each, uh, each domain. Instead, we have a, like a central model and we can be quickly adapted to different domains. And also we can combine the power of different data in different domains so that we can utilize the data set uh, from uh, all the different uh, specific domains. Okay, um, a second question is about biases. So we know that I think you used Wikipedia for your evaluations on question generation. So yeah. if, for example, we apply this approach on another corpus and we know that corpora are biased. Uh, so what do you think about the generated questions? Uh, actually, uh, I, I haven't uh, taken this into account uh, yet. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Bank. So if there is no questions, so uh, I wish a very nice day to everyone. And thank you again very much.